in many ways, I see the futures. Last year, there was considerable buzz surrounding the sudden interest of the world's largest asset manager in Bitcoin, the premier cryptocurrency. Since its inception, Bitcoin has stood in stark contrast to the ethos of Wall Street. However, BlackRock shattered this barrier by applying to the SEC for approval to offer a spot Bitcoin ETF. The excitement reached new heights when BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, once a Bitcoin critic, lauded the leading cryptocurrency as a global asset capable of shielding investors from currency debasement. In subsequent interviews, Fink referred to one of Bitcoin's rallies as a flight to quality, highlighting pent-up demand for cryptocurrencies worldwide. While Fink has remained steadfast in his support of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, renowned hedge fund manager Mark Yusko questions his true motives. During a recent interview with Sin City Crypto, the Morgan Creek Capital founder and CIO discussed purported plans involving the Securities and Exchange Commission, BlackRock, and major financial services firms like JP Morgan, designated as authorized participants, to deeply infiltrate the cryptocurrency industry for potential price manipulation. Yusko suggests that without court orders and public scrutiny, the SEC might have exclusively approved BlackRock's application, delaying others significantly. Before we continue with the rest of the video, do check out daily 5-minute crypto newsletter with all the latest crypto and Bitcoin news. It's a fantastic analysis of on-chain crypto data and breakdowns, and the best part is it's absolutely free. They'll cover expert predictions, breakdowns of on-chain crypto data, and any breaking news you need to know, all in a nutshell. Click the first link in the description and enter your email to join over 50,000 others in becoming a better crypto investor right now. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. For years, any commodity that has futures has been subject to manipulation. Yeah. Right? If in the old days, if, if I had a barrel of oil and I wanted to sell it to you, I actually had to have title to that oil. I had to be able to go produce that actual barrel of oil, deliver it to you. You had to have facilities to take delivery and we could have a transaction. And then they created the world of futures. And now I can create a paper barrel of oil out of thin air. Like literally, there doesn't have to be any oil. And I can promise to deliver you oil. And as long as we settle up the transaction before the date, I don't have to go find the oil from somebody and buy it and deliver it to you on some tr you know, tanker truck and send it up to Chicago. And so what happens is you get naked shorting on the other side. You can have naked long. You can get, you know, what's that creation of many, many, many paper barrels out of thin air. And what eventually happens in all these commodity markets is you get a big supply demand imbalance caused by the creation of this, these paper commodities. And you've seen it in oil markets, you've seen it in grain markets, you've seen it in the gold market. I mean, the gold market is famous for this, right? All the GLD longs, I shouldn't say all, many of the GLD longs are just offset by shorts from JP Morgan and, and Rothschild Bank in, in uh, London, and they can manipulate the price of gold and I, well, the thing I love about it is they're like, oh, they're not doing that. I'm like, well, J.P. Morgan actually admitted to doing it. Mm. They actually paid a fine yep. of $960 million, almost a billion dollars two years ago. But I love their comment. They're like, yeah, we paid the fine, but we didn't have to admit guilt. I love that part. You can pay a billion dollars and not admit <laughs> guilt. But Funny. we made $20 billion, so it's like a cost of doing business. I believe the original plan was they were going to punt everybody else, give BlackRock the go-ahead. BlackRock was going to accumulate these, these big positions. The banks, the JP Morgans, et cetera, would take the other side, short the futures. And part of the reason people think that the launch was a failure is that's precisely what happened for the first week. Right. Right? You had... You had the people come in before. We went from 40K to 47. We had that nice parabolic rise. And then you had the launch. And it was interesting, very underreported. Uh, I tweeted about this, but no one cared. There was a, a launch of a second futures contract precisely on January 11th, mm. the exact same day as the approval 
of the ETFs. So you basically had a whole bunch of people shorting futures against these longs. And you had the liquidation of GBTC shares because they had high prices and people who didn't have a tax problem were like, I'm out and I'll transfer. So you had a combination of, of factors that pushed prices down. People were like, oh my God, it's a failure. Like, no, you're missing the forest for the trees. Mm. You bring up the point, right? There are groups, Fidelity being one, and eventually all of them have said, we're going to put in 1%. Now, Vanguard, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, um, LPL this morning, um, UBS have all said, nope, nope, this is still too risky. Now, what that is code for is Ms. Warren called them up and said, do not <laughs> allow your client. What if you look at the largest campaign con contributors to Ms. Warren, mm. you will find a stunning similarity to the largest financial services companies in, in the country. Despite the alleged collusion between major financial services firms, senators, and regulators, Yesco remains confident that spot Bitcoin ETFs have been and will continue to be beneficial for Bitcoin, as well as other cryptocurrencies. According to the esteemed hedge fund manager, at least 1% of the $30 trillion currently under the control of financial advisors will find its way into Bitcoin. While he acknowledges that this process may unfold more slowly than initially anticipated, Yusko anticipates a rapid acceleration over the coming year. For instance, Fidelity recently revealed plans to allocate 1% to spot Bitcoin in its all-in-one conservative ETF, marking a significant milestone for Bitcoin. This move is expected to prompt similar actions from many other institutions in the coming weeks and months. Let's return to Yusko's interview for further insights. My guess is, in the long run, and Eric Balkunas said this, right? He did the math. There's, there's $30 trillion controlled by advisors at these big allocation shops. If 1% comes in to Bitcoin through the ETFs, that's $300 billion on an asset that trades about $10 billion a day. That will have a massive price impact. It will also solidify the, the long-term kind of penetration of Bitcoin into, into financial services. But most importantly, what it'll do is it'll sop up all of the incremental supply from mining yeah. for the next few years. And I made a big statement, and I, I, I might not turn out to be right, but I still made it. I believe this year, in 2024, more fiat will be converted to Bitcoin than all the previous 15 years. Wow. Which is not that big a stretch because, you know, we've got about a $900 billion market cap. But most of that isn't money that came in. Right. Right? Yeah. When, when, you know, when it was $10,000 price, about $10 billion came in through GBTC and the price moved to almost $60,000. So, so much of that market cap is actually just price appreciation of the original hodlers and miners. And so I don't know the exact number, I probably should, um, of how much fiat has converted into Bitcoin since inception. But I, I think $300 billion which, you know, could come in over the next year, um, would probably be close. It started, but it's the very, very tip of the iceberg, or that's probably the wrong analogy, but it's the very beginning of a wave. You know, think about, you know, it's the butterfly wing flapping in Japan, and then you get a tsunami in California. I mean, it's literally going to look like that. Right? There's this little tiny ripple in the water and then it's going to start to grow and it's going to start to grow and it's going to start to grow and it's going to start to grow. And eventually we're going to be talking, you know, billions and billions of dollars every day uh, that's going to come in. And, you know, you got people saying, oh, you know, Saudi Arabia is going to buy a million Bitcoin. Uh, OK, maybe. I mean, they might be smart to do that. I mean, they have an amazing stranded uh, natural resource asset 
in in Saudi that they could monetize if they got more involved in, in Bitcoin, particularly mining. And there are lots of corporations that are looking at what MicroStrategy has done and saying, huh, I mean, we, to a much smaller degree, much smaller, um, you know, we have uh, on balance sheet Bitcoin um, in our fund. You know, we run a, a Bitcoin fund and, um, you know, we put Morgan Creek balance sheet assets in there. Um, so I think that's going to become more and more of a of a commonplace thing. Hedge funds have been around. Most of them were using the futures. Uh, I think they're you know going to migrate eventually to spot. You know, some of them are sophisticated and they've already been in spot directly. Uh, they're probably not going to change. They've got Bitcoin based accounts. There will be lots and lots of. Uh, other mutual funds, other ETFs, brokerage firms that integrate this. And, and they're institutions too, right? If if Merrill Lynch, Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, changes their mind, which I, I think they will, and says, all right, we're going to include this in our model portfolios, it could go into lots and lots of products across their platform. Fidelity's recent announcement generated considerable excitement within the Bitcoin community, potentially contributing to the ongoing rally. According to the disclosure, Fidelity Investments Canada has integrated a 1-3% to Bitcoin allocation into its all-in-one asset allocation funds, encompassing spot Bitcoin ETFs. The firm views this as a cost-effective solution aligned with an integrated strategic asset allocation model and consistent portfolio rebalancing. The specific inclusion is observed in the Fidelity All-in-One Conservative ETF, strategically designed to provide a balanced investment approach, comprising approximately 40% equities and 59% fixed-income ETFs. With the additional 1% allocation in cryptocurrencies, the decision has received widespread applause on platforms like Twitter. Senior Bloomberg ETF analyst Eric Balkun has highlighted the significance of incorporating Bitcoin into a conservative fund, expressing a positive outlook on the cryptocurrency. Many consider this move a substantial milestone that may pave the way for other financial institutions to follow suit. Feel free to share your thoughts on Mark Yesko's interview, especially his insights on BlackRock, JP Morgan, and the SEC. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.